Hey everybody, it's Allie and welcome to our Y&R chat for Sunday, December 9th, 2012. I woke up yesterday morning and I saw that Young and the Restless was in the top 10 searches on Yahoo and I immediately had a panic attack. I didn't know what it was about, but initially I'm thinking, please tell me that the show is not canceled. I automatically have a bad reaction. I click on the link and I see that it was actually a positive story. The Young and the Restless hit a major milestone. They are 24 years as the number one daytime drama. Of course, there aren't very many daytime dramas left, but 24 years is a pretty significant stretch of time. I have been watching for 19 of those years, which I think is nothing to shake a stick at. <laughs> and that's watching daily. I've watched daily and religiously <laughs> for those 19 years. So I thought this would be maybe a good opening opportunity to have you guys tell me how long you have been watching the show. I'm sure I've asked this question before, but I, it's, you know, I forget. So <laughs> Why don't you leave me a comment and let me know how long you have been watching YNR. I know that there are a lot of veterans who've been a lot around a long time, way longer than me, and there are lots of new viewers too, and there's nothing wrong with being a new viewer, believe me. The new viewers sometimes bring perspective to the show that those of us who have been watching it so long and have held on to stories that we, you know, we really connected with so long, sometimes we're not able to see things from a fresh perspective. So I love the old viewers and the new viewers alike, and I'm looking forward to hearing from you guys this week. Tell me how long you've been watching the show and what you think about this news of it being number one. Number one! I want to get one of those big foam number one fingers. Why it are? Maybe, hey, with all of the new press, I mean, I think it was Young and the Restless was a tw trending topic on Twitter. A twinning topic on Twitter. Um, so that's good. Who knows? Maybe that could bring in some new viewers. The more viewers we have, the longer the show will run, I hope, and the more people will get engaged. And I always love to share my love of YNR, so I hope that that just ropes more people into watching. It's a good show! It is just as good as any of the nighttime dramas that are out there. I love YNR, I always have, and I'm gonna watch it till the day it dies. <laughs> and I hope it never does. <laughs> but. This week started out with a huge fight between Adam and Chelsea because at the end of last week's show, Chelsea gave Adam an ultimatum. She said, I am tired of everything always being about Sharon and it's causing problems in our relationship. Clearly, if you care about me, if you want to fix this, never see her again. I don't want to hear her name. I don't want to know that you've been with her. If you want to fix our marriage, Sharon has to be out of it. And it erupted in this huge fight between Adam and Chelsea, which I've never really seen before. I don't think I have ever seen Adam scream at anyone the way he was screaming at Chelsea. Adam always... Even when it's an emotional situation, he always has kind of an understated reaction to things. He was over the top this week. You could tell that whatever's going on inside of him, this hit a core. He wants both. He wants his wife, but he wants Sharon too. And it was hard watching him get so worked up like that. And Chelsea too. I think Chelsea is desperate. She sees that her marriage is in real trouble, and she's become extremely paranoid about it, rightfully so, but she's always making little remarks about Sharon or, you know, just she's always poking, poking at him about it. And it makes me think Chelsea is really pushing Adam 
into Sharon's arms in a lot of ways just by always being on the negative side of it and always having her little quips. After they had this huge argument, Adam goes to walk out. There's nothing more to be said. And she said something like, yeah, you're going to go see Sharon. And it, it's, it's, it sounds like paranoia <laughs> if you're not a viewer and you don't know that he's getting ready to go to Sharon. That's exactly what he did. And it's... It is hard from just from, you know, any kind of relationship perspective to see what a wedge has been driven in between a husband and a wife. Chelsea, tell, you know, she kind of tells him to, you know, get out and go see Sharon in a, in a sarcastic way. And then she goes looking for him. I think she realizes that she's made a mistake. And that's exactly what she's doing, pushing him into Sharon's arms. And she goes to the new restaurant uh, on the boulevard and she runs into Nikki who is sitting at the bar waiting for Victor and I just wanted to mention this because it was an interesting little scene between Nikki and Chelsea because Nikki <laughs> was of course very rude of, at first. Chelsea walks up to Nikki and says, oh Nikki have you seen Adam? And Nikki got her panties all up in a bundle and said something to Chelsea about, oh, well, I can see that just because you have money now doesn't mean that you have manners. <laughs> I don't know what the problem is. I think Nick, Nikki was texting on her phone, maybe, but is it really horrible manners to approach someone? Like, you don't approach the Nikki. How dare you? And it was it was weird to see Nikki being so rude to Chelsea, and then she started reeling it back in. There was a, actually a kind of a tender moment between them where Nikki apologized for being so uppity and asked Chelsea what was wrong. Chelsea said, look, I'm not going to give you any ammunition against me by telling you what's wrong with my life. And Nikki said, look, me and Victor aren't exactly in a good place, so tell me what's up. And it was just interesting to see these two women almost kind of connecting. I, I, it's, I don't think it's going to last <laughs> in any way. I have a feeling that uh, Nikki's going to go right back to being rude to Chelsea the next time she sees her, but it was just a, a interesting little scene. Now, while Chelsea's out looking for Adam, we know exactly where he went. Why would she even go to the restaurant looking for him? He was with Sharon. <laughs> well, of course. He goes to Sharon and he, he wants to connect with her. He wants to talk to her. By helping her, he in a way seems to be helping himself, or at least he thinks that he is. And Sharon, after having had a meeting with her psychiatrist, um, has decided that she needs to find a touchstone that is not Adam. She needs to find a centered place for when everything else in her life is going crazy or she's feeling anxiety. She needs to have a place to go that makes her feel safe. And for Sharon, it has been Adam in the past and she realizes that that's not exactly healthy. He is a married man. Yes, he's her ex-husband, but he needs to live his life and she needs to live hers. So this is the conclusion Sharon comes to and when Adam shows up at her doorstep, she tries to send him away. She says, this isn't what I need. I just, I, I think you should go back to your wife. In fact, Sharon told him, go back and focus on your family. You need to forget about me. And Adam immediately starts rejecting this. He is, almost he gets a little bit of anxiety himself and he says, no, no, I don't want to not be with you. I, I need you too. I need you. He even said something like, I could give up anything else, my job, my money, anything, but not you. <laughs> that was very telling. It's, there is just something between them that always has been and always will be. And it was very... He didn't include Chelsea in that. He seems... Like I said, I think he really wants both. But Sharon actually had the presence of mind to just kind of cut it off. And they had this goodbye moment. Like, yes, I understand. I have to go back to my wife and... And Sharon needs to go in and, and recover. But it's, I mean, even as they're saying this goodbye, I'm realizing that it's not actually going to be goodbye. But I feel that it was...
was kind of the right thing for Sharon to do. Sharon needs to focus on herself right now. Just let Adam and Chelsea's marriage unravel on its own. Sharon needs to focus on Sharon. So I, at the end of that scene, I actually kind of thought, all right, all right, I'm okay with this. Sharon, she's going to do her thing. Adam and Chelsea, they can do whatever they're going to do. Obviously, the damage has been done. But Adam goes home to Chelsea, and she's waiting there for him. And he actually said something to her to the effect of, it's done with Sharon. Just so you know, it's, it's done with Sharon. And he presented it as if he had cut things off with Sharon, as if he had ended whatever was going on between them. When it was Sharon, Sharon he wanted to stay, he wanted to continue this. And I thought that was very revealing, that he kind of wanted Chelsea to believe that he was done with it of his own volition, and that really was not the case. <sighs> not good news. <laughs> her marriage. You know that the damage, again, has already been done. And Sharon is on damage control for her own life. Nick found out from Phyllis this week that Sharon is back. Phyllis saw Sharon and saw, and was, saw Sharon and Noah and knew that Noah knew. So um, Nick found out about this. He confronts Noah immediately, not happy that this is a secret that has been kept from him. And Nick and Noah go to see Sharon. Now, this is the first time that Sharon and Nick have seen each other since probably Victor's funeral, I would assume. And at first, Nick was pretty sensitive. You know, he he was handling her with kid gloves. And I have been thinking within the past week, why isn't Nick helping Sharon more? Why wasn't he trying to find her and making that a top priority in his life? Why was it Adam? Because Nick and Sharon uh, were supposed to have some kind of incredible connection. They always have. And it, it does bother me that that seems completely gone now. I realize that a lot of water has flown underneath that bridge. But at the same time, they do still have two children together, a young child. I mean, they were in love enough to have sex and have a child a couple of years ago. So it doesn't entirely make sense to me that Nick would be so removed from her life. But Nick is judgmental. He really is. He's been through and so much with her that you can just tell he's he's domineering and he is judgmental. Like he always wanted Sharon to be a certain thing, a, a, an angel. And as soon as she wasn't that, it, he started wandering. He started having the affair with Phyllis, who was the exact opposite. And so it just it, bu it bugged me about Nick a little bit, especially when he started pressing Sharon. She's clearly upset and delicate, and it's difficult for her to come face to face with Nick. And he starts, I don't know, like telling her, she actually opens up and tells him that she has bipolar disorder, and he immediately is like, who is your psychiatrist? I want to meet with them. That is so incredibly, incredibly inappropriate. Where did you find this psychiatrist? Who is this person who is telling you this? I, I must get up all in it. And she tells him, you know, Adam has been the one helping me, he hooked me up with her, and as soon as Nick hears Adam's name, he freaks out. He starts grilling her about Adam and, and everything, where she's been, what happened with the ranch. Straight up asked her if she burdened down the ranch, to which she was like, no, no, of course not. And, um, and it, was, it was hard for her. The whole thing was, I think, hard for her. Because Nick was like her worst case scenario of people to face. She has been, you know, real, real skittish about uh, getting uh, seen in public and and being able to to face these people that she's hurt again. And Nick, I think, was the first person she faced and probably the hardest person that she had to face uh, because he's so judgmental of her. But she conquered it. You know, she was able to do that. And I think that gave her a little bit of strength. I think that helped her carry on. Now, as soon as Nick leaves her house, where does he go? He goes to Adam. 
at Newman Enterprises, where Adam's sitting behind the Newman Enterprises desk, and he confronts him immediately, like, I don't know what you're doing with Sharon, I don't know what your M.O. is, Adam. As long as you're helping her, that's okay, but don't you even think about Miss Seppin, because if you do, I'm, you're going to have me to deal with, was kind of how it went down, and uh, I was very, very impressed, because Adam, again, very cool and collected, as he usually is, sits behind the desk, and he just looks at... Nick and says, you know, Nick, have you ever really taken a look at a black and white picture? It's mostly gray. We're all gray, Nick. <laughs> Best line! Best line, I think, that I've heard from Adam and I don't know how long. And he said it to establish that I'm not all good. I'm not all bad. Nothing is really all good or all bad. It is many shades of gray. And that's what I am. That's kind of what everyone is. And I just thought that was, it was just such an, a great line. It was very insightful into his character. Uh, I, I just totally enjoyed that scene because of that. And, of course, this visit <laughs> between uh, Nick and, and with this confrontation of Nick coming to see him created an excuse for Adam to go back to see Sharon after they had just had this dramatic goodbye he goes back to see her she uh, Sh Sharon keeps pushing him away and he keeps coming back and I, I don't know if it's a good thing or not I feel conflicted about it because uh, Sharon at this point is all alone in that house and I don't think that's a good place for her to be she's just alone there with her thoughts she really does need to be surrounded by people. I just think it really kind of should be Nick and Noah. Uh, I, don't, I mean, in a perfect world, I'm not saying that I don't like Adam and Sharon together because I think I do. But at the same time, she needs support from her family and her loved ones that it, it doesn't have a sexual undertone and a complication. Her life is complicated enough and now she doesn't need to get involved with a married man. So that's just kind of how I feel about that. I mean, Sharon is, it's weird because there are moments where she's strong and there are moments where she is really manic. Like she was cooking something or eating something and she accidentally spilled something all over her shirt. And she was just so upset about that. She was trying to, it was a white shirt and she was trying really hard to scrub out the stains, but they were all down the front of her and that whole moment had a very it was very Shakespearean it was it was just kind of like um, Lady Macbeth where she is you know out damn spot and uh, Lady Macbeth from that play eventually like the guilt over her husband's murder drove her insane and I kind of think that that was maybe a parallel that was being made because it's the guilt over what she has done to the Newman family and to kind of everybody in her life that's driving her insane and she gets manic on that spot and she's just like out oh, damn spot and it was a it was a uh, I don't know, that was just a very kind of interesting moment um, but as soon as she gets into that manic mode she finds her touchstone, which is a drawing that I think Noah did for her. Um, her touchstone having, sh trying, she's trying to shift it from Adam onto her kids. That's what she's trying to focus on right now. So she's looking at this drawing that Noah did and she's thinking about how she wants to get better for her kids and how she really wants to reconcile with the family, the whole family. Victor and Nikki are now living at the penthouse, which is fine, but, 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 but what about the ranch? <laughs> Does this mean that they're not going to rebuild the ranch? Because I really want the ranch back. I mean, not that there's anything wrong with the penthouse. The penthouse was just fine, but I feel emotionally attached to the ranch. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know how I feel about this. Um, I mean, the new pe the penthouse is fine. I, I guess I'm a little confused because it doesn't look at 
all, like fundamentally at all like the original penthouse. So I don't know if it's a new penthouse or if, I mean, Victor had a penthouse back in the 90s that he lived at when he was separated from Nikki and she lived at the ranch. So I don't know if this is the original penthouse and Nikki just totally redecorated it including giving it stairs in different places <laughs> um, and doors in different places or I don't know I'm not sure it's it's certainly better than the original penthouse I thought it looked nice Nikki set it up as a surprise for Victor and she decorated it and everything and he seemed like he loved it I, I mean I'm just I gotta know what you guys think about the new penthouse please tell me what are your initial impressions I think it's really nice, of course, it's a, I mean, I wouldn't mind living there, <laughs> but at the same time, I think, is it really Victor? Does it say Victor to me? Because it says more Nikki to me. I don't know, I just think there's a lot of modern art, and Victor is much more classic he's much more greek and greek god and power and you know that's sort of his whole vibe he's got an old style about about him i mean think about victor's office he has it decorated with like a greek bust on the wall for crying out loud he has horses and it's he has a very sort of i'm sorry it's just greek <laughs> it's his whole stylistic vibe and this is much more light and airy and floral um i mean it was it was good it was it was definitely fine the one thing i keep noticing though is i don't know i'm seeing a lot of shadows on the sets lately which i've never really noticed that before but uh, there's like I just see shadows like people are walking around and I can see their shadow reflected on the wall it happened at one point during the a restaurant scene it happened at um, the tack house and it happened at the penthouse and I mean that's kind of bad like a professionally lighted set shouldn't have shadows I mean, you shouldn't see shadows of the of the characters on the walls in the background I don't know that was just kind of weird I'm wondering if anybody else noticed that but Whatever, I like the new penthouse, even if it is more Nikki than it is Victor. I like the piano. I, I'm glad that they brought that back into the picture. And Nikki sat down and she played Victor a little song, which was cute. Does, does um, anybody know if Melody Thomas Scott really does play the piano? I don't know if it's if that's her playing or if that's totally a trick. I have no clue. But it was a nice moment. They're relaxing in their new place and, um, you know, having her play him a song. And it's very indicative of them getting their relationship and their life and rebuilding it all. Um, I, I like, most of all, the windows of the penthouse. There are these huge, huge windows with an amazing view <laughs> of Genoa City. <laughs> And it was it was just a great skyline. I love the shears that are over the windows. Um, I love. I really like all of the floral arrangements. I think it's nice. It's fresh. And I was pretty excited that Nikki and Victor decided to have a party to celebrate their new place, like a housewarming party. It's I. It's been a while since we've had a formal event. <laughs> of course, I'm sure when you all throw housewarming parties, it's formal. <laughs> formal attire required. Oh, don't worry, it's just going to be a relaxed family thing, but please put on your formal wear. <laughs> it was a very classy, she-she event, which I was excited about because it's been a while. You know I like to look at their clothes. <laughs> Um, everyone pretty much was invited that was in the close family. Abby couldn't be there, so she sent her own gift, which was a case of champagne and a bartender <laughs> named Carmine <laughs> to wait at the event, which was a funny little uh, jab, I think, at Victor, like, here's your gift and my boyfriend. Now, interesting casting update. Marcy Ryland is coming back to YNR as Abby, and I am so excited to hear what you guys have to say about that. I it's it's funny because I was so irritated with the character of Abby for ever for so long, and then as soon as she left, I was like, mm, I miss Abby. <laughs> so I really hope 
that bringing her back is going to, I hope that they're going to focus on her. I hope that they're going to give her, a, you know, a conscience and that they're going to, I don't know, really focus on the character and give her her own storylines rather than just being a B player. I think if we really get to know Abby, it'll be easier to like her this time. I'm not a big fan of Carmine, but... Mm, Oh well, I mean, if that's what it is, we'll, we'll just see. It's really going to depend. But it was funny because as soon as I saw Carmine on screen, I was a meet. I immediately went to look at casting updates, and bam, right on my right there it was Marcy Rowling coming back. Because I thought, why would they bring back Carmine if Abby's gone? That wouldn't make sense. And there it was. So that's just a little interesting tidbit, and I'm curious to think or curious to hear what you guys have uh, to say about that. Now, Victor. <laughs> In addition to the, you know, the regular usual suspects, he invited Adam to this party and didn't tell anyone, by the way, didn't tell Nikki that he was inviting the black sheep son that everybody hates. But in Victor's mind, I think he's trying to get Newman Enterprises back, of course. So he's trying to build a false sense of security with Adam. And in a way, it, almost, it seems like Adam is wary of it, but in a way, it almost seems as if he's kind of fallen for it. Like, oh, I just want to see what's up with this. Because Adam, at his core, I think, has always wanted to be accepted and admired and praised by Victor. And here is his opportunity. None of his other kids are really able to fight for Newman Enterprises. So maybe Adam will come through and... and and do that, which I think would be great. I would love to see Adam get the company. That'd be wonderful. Um, so it was an, an awkwardness. Um, and while Victor called Adam to invite him to this party, Sharon overheard in the background, of course he was with Sharon, that th there, there was a party. <laughs> so Sharon becomes aware of this party. And at first, Adam didn't want to go. He, you know, was suspicious naturally, but he changes his mind and decides to take Chelsea with him and they go, they go. They were the first people to arrive. <laughs> so it, for a while, a, a long while, it was Victor and Nikki and Chelsea and Adam awkwardness. <laughs> I can't believe Adam would be the first to arrive for crying out loud. It was just weird. There was so much just serious awkwardness. And actually... I was surprised at how nice both Victor and Nikki were being toward Chelsea. I mean, Victor, for crying out loud, remember when he offered her a cool million dollars to leave town? And now he's saying, oh, you look so beautiful. And Nikki, I was annoyed with Nikki about this. She said to Chelsea, oh, yes, um, we did hear about the, that you lost the baby and, and you are in our thoughts. Why didn't you say that to her a couple hours ago when you saw her at the restaurant rather than ripping her a new one about how she is just a ragamuffin with no manners? Where did that even come from? It was just as if Nikki and Victor had their polite faces on and it, none of it was genuine. That, that was just an annoying, annoying moment, I thought. Um, but later... Summer shows up at the party, too, and it creates extra awkwardness for Adam and Chelsea. Chelsea couldn't even look at Summer. It automatically drained anything fun out of her time. I mean, Summer tried to walk up to them and just kind of say hi, but Chelsea walked away and Adam just kind of stopped Summer and said, I don't think you want to do that. I think you just need to stay away, which is true. But, you know, I kind of felt a little, I, saw, I felt sorry for both of them, frankly. It just it was such an unfortunate incident. And unfortunately for Chelsea, it probably was losing the baby that really um, ruined her marriage. <laughs> that really kind of caused the end of that. I, I'm surprised that they even stayed after that, because it was a real, real downer. Um, Victoria was there at the party <laughs> on her own. Billy was not invited. <laughs> he was cordially uninvited, in fact. Nikki and Victor decided they were going to throw this party, and immediately were like, uh, yeah, Victoria, can you come without your husband? <laughs> and she she didn't want to go at first, but she decided to, to show up. Uh, Nick was kind of the same way. He didn't want to go, but he decided to go for his mother, and he brings Avery with him. Uh, um, 
So they were there. Michael and Lauren were supposed to be there, but they barely got out the door. <laughs> the night Michael had a, a work, it was their anniversary for one thing, and then Michael had to, got a call from work, and so they stayed home, which was unfortunate. But um, the, the whole thing was, like, the whole party, everyone there, it was tense, but it was manageable. It wasn't, it wasn't real, it was tense, but not the worst it could possibly be. And then Sharon shows up, which was pretty ballsy on her part. She knocks on the door, Victor opens it, and he's like, you can't come home, you shouldn't be here. <laughs> and, oh my god, I mean, he was like, no, you can't come in, you cannot come in, this is a private party. And then Nikki shows up behind him and sees Sharon there, and is practically, like, f shooting flames out of her face onto Sharon. It was a very, like, you're not welcome here. And Sharon, to her credit, she just breezed right on past him, she just walked right in the door, even, even though they were like, no, you can't come in. She was just, pshoo, here I go. Oh, I mean, ew. The whole thing, oh my gosh. I mean, even just right off the bat, forgive the expression, please. But Sharon showing up at the party, in and of himself, was like a turd in the punch bowl. Everybody is just like, seriously, Sharon, wow. It was awkward anyway, and now Sharon's there. And she proceeds <laughs> to offer actually a pretty hostile apology. I mean, she knows right off the bat that everyone is against her, and all she wants to do is get out the words, I'm sorry. You know, she says, I'm not, you know, I'm not here to ruin things for you. I just, I want to tell you that I'm sorry for what I've done to your family. And it just, the whole vibe that Sharon had was so desperate. She's just trying to admit her mistakes to everyone. I shouldn't have done this. I realize that now. And Nikki... Victor and Victoria are berating her the whole time. They are just slinging any kind of mud they can her way, and Sharon's trying to take it. She's trying to take the punches. And in fact, Sharon was even kind of trying to respond in a positive way toward them by saying, yes, you know, I understand why you feel that way. Um, you know, I realize that now. And they just kept coming at her, just berating her and telling her to get out of here and she doesn't belong. And the entire time, Nick and Noah are, are trying nicely to coax her to leave. She's making a scene, and it's not helping her. She's trying, I think, to, to apologize and to do something good, and it's just bad. It's, it was not the place. Um, they weren't expecting to see her. They had no frame of reference. She crashed their party. Uh, you know, and a kind of unexpected forgiveness. It was a bad idea. Noah and, and Nick are trying to coax her to leave, like trying to talk someone down from a ledge. Um, and they're just trying to be really, really careful with her. And she's just saying desperately, I need to make them understand. I need to make them understand that I didn't mean to hurt them. <sighs> she was actually, for a lot of it, it's almost childlike, just kind of screaming and just, I know I want them to know that I'm, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm sorry. It was very, just almost like a fit, but I mean, it, it was, it was really sad. I, I don't even know how to describe it to you. It was just so sad and so desperate, and I really did have a tear in my eye watching her do that, but also kind of this pitiful look on my face like, oh, Sharon, oh girl, you have made another mistake. Mm. Mistakes on top of mistakes. There was no forgiveness in that room. And in fact, <laughs> Chelsea had Adam on a leash the entire time. I mean, she had that leash tight up on him like, don't you dare. Don't you even think about it. Don't you say a word to her. Don't you try to interrupt on this. Don't you even think about riding to the rescue. <laughs> and Adam did. He did. He tried. He's, he couldn't help himself. He had to stand up for her just a little bit and then tell her, there's no forgiveness in this room. You really should go. Uh, but she, she just really was not hearing it. I think she genuinely thought that she would get forgiveness if she had admitted her sins. That was almost the whole idea behind it. If I confess, you know, if I say that I'm sorry, then my conscience will be clear. And it was very hard for her. 
obviously it was very hard for her. Um, she was struggling the whole time. And it's, it's not uh, insignificant that she had the strength to face her enemies and try to make amends. I think her heart was in the right place. It was just she forgot who she was dealing with. She's been out of the loop for a while and she forgot who she was dealing with. I mean... Victor thought she was drunk. He straight up <laughs> said, you're drunk, get out. And uh, she said, I haven't even had a drink. I mean, she's so out of it. She's just spinning around. It was, it was not, it was only devolving. It was bad from the minute she walked in the door and worse, the minute she ran out in tears. Ugh. My goodness, she just like bolted for the door in tears. And I, Adam actually went after her when she left, which I thought, why does he have to be the one to go after her? Why, why wasn't Noah, why weren't Noah and Nick managing the situation better? Well, especially Noah, he's been really, really close with her. Why couldn't he have just, okay, mom, let's, why could, like, I just, uh, why didn't he run after her? I, I'm, I feel like they are being so much less supportive than Adam, and while Adam's being super supportive of Sharon, he abandons Chelsea at the party with no ride, no way to get home. Victor had to, send, you know, give her his car, like, have a driver take her home. That is so freaking rude. He just abandoned her after she was like, don't you dare. He did it anyway. He goes running out the door after Sharon, and my goodness, like, <laughs> the tension between everyone just got worse after that, especially with, uh, with Nick and Victor after Sharon was gone. Nick actually walked up to Victor and Nikki and Victoria and started pointing out how totally inappropriate it was for them to start just leaning into Sharon and saying horrible things about her and to her in front of Noah, who was right there in the room. So it was totally rude. Like, Victor and Nikki and Victoria were especially evil <laughs> towards Sharon. But I am trying to see the other side of this because they don't know that she is mentally ill. Sharon tried to explain to them, you know, that the reason I did what I did was because I was sick. I was sick. And she didn't elaborate further on it. She wanted to tell them that she, she wanted to tell them about her illness, but she couldn't. I think she, you know, knew that it was just opening up a, another weakness. So Victor and Nikki and Victoria, although they were evil toward her, they didn't know that she was mentally ill. For crying out loud, this whole bipolar thing just came out of nowhere on all of us. I mean, I'm looking back to everything that she did with, uh, Vic, you know, not telling everyone about, uh, you know, uh, or, j j that Victor was still alive and before that, I mean, the ridiculous marriage and getting involved with Tucker and trying to take over the company. Like, nobody was feeling sorry for Sharon then. And now all of a sudden, you know, like, I, I just, I want to see it from the other side too, because it's like, we're supposed to feel sorry for her now. I mean, this, like, the whole bipolar thing, I'm sorry, you guys. It's like some writer just pulled it out of his butt as a way to explain away the crazy writing that has been going on with Sharon for the past year or two. That's all it is. I'm sorry. Like, I do feel sympathy for her, and I think that the bipolar thing is a way to start building sympathy for Sharon. I mean, the whole scene at the penthouse was intended to make you feel sorry for Sharon so that you will forgive her. It, the, this dramatic speech that she was giving, wanting forgiveness, is not just about the other characters in the scene. It's about you. They want you to forgive Sharon because they dragged her character so far down through the dirt that nobody believed that she would be able to recover. This is all part of it. And if you, just, if you ask me, Sharon was totally cognizant of what she was doing to Victor and to the rest of them. She was horrible to Victor and Nikki and Victoria, too. So there's a reason that they were ripping into her. And there was a reason, I think, a conscious reason, that Sharon was ripping into them when she was doing all the things she was doing. Sharon had no problem waltzing right into that boardroom announcing that she was Victor Newman. She was going to take over his company and be him. That was cognizant. So I'm sorry, like, it's only within the past few weeks that she's even started to seem mentally ill. It's even, you, we've started to see 
that there may be, a, 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 you know, an, an illness behind it. Like, uh, I don't know. <sighs> I'm sorry. <laughs> this has nothing to do with me disliking Sharon in any way because I don't. I love Sharon. I have loved Sharon since the day she walked into Genoa City. I was watching the day she walked into Genoa City. So it's not an anti-Sharon thing in any way. I... I'm sorry, it's just that the whole bipolar thing is clearly a plot device. In a couple of weeks, maybe even a couple of months, they will get Sharon back to where they want her to be on an even keel. You will never hear another word about the whole bipolar thing. And if she ever starts acting crazy again, it'll all be just blamed on that. <laughs> it'll be like, oh, Sharon, did she go off her meds? Give me a break. I'm, I, I enjoyed the scene. I really did. But I, I, I'm trying to see it from both perspectives, from Sharon's perspective and from the family's perspective, and I get it from both places. So, in a way, I almost felt like Carmine <laughs> observing this whole thing. Like, I'm not, I'm not on anyone's side. I'm not a member of this family. I'm just watching the drama go down. And the entire time that this meltdown was happening and the fight was happening, Carmine was kind of snickering in the background like, wow, these rich people, you know, I mean, they've got everything and they can't figure life out. And it, it was so totally stupid because after Sharon left and then after Nick and Victor uh, got done with their fight and it was just everything was sort of quiet for a brief moment, Noah goes to the bar to get a drink, and Carmine starts shooting his mouth off, talking about, like, he made a, some comment to Noah about his crazy mom, basically like, yeah, your mom, Sharon, she's a, <laughs> what? Like, you don't talk about somebody's mama like that. I mean, Noah immediately grabbed him by the collar, and they had to pull him off of him. Like, why would Carmine go shooting his mouth off about someone's mother and not expect to get in a fight? Oh, that was bad. I mean, that was just like the perfect end or the perfectly horrible night. Victor just gives Carmine a wad of cash and says, get out of here and don't you come back again. <laughs> I don't ever want to see you in here again. Never come to my house again, <laughs> which you know he probably will <laughs> just because of that. Um, so <laughs> by this time, Sharon has gotten home. And she is just, this was a bad idea, this was a bad idea, why did I do that? It's a bad idea. And Adam arrives just a few minutes after her. He's trying to tell her that everything is okay, trying to understand what she's going through, trying to identify and help her feel comfortable. And, um, I mean, he's really, he's trying to make kind of excuses for her in a way, like your heart was in the right place. You know, I mean, he, he understands her. But she, although she wants to be close with him, she is still hesitant. You know, he's saying all the right things, and I think that he has the ability to calm her down. He has the ability to make her feel safe again, and that, you know, maybe it wasn't a good idea, but it's okay. This isn't going to totally ruin my recovery. But she hears what he's saying, but does not want to be involved with him. She wants to be able to do it herself and not have to rely on him. So she tells him, again, to leave. She says, you need to get out of here now. She runs over the door. She flings open the door wide, just in a, get out, go ahead. The door's open for you, just go. And she continues to just like flip, just, just, yeah, she's a big ball of anxiety. So Adam <laughs> grabs her just to kind of settle her down and they come face to face. <laughs> And the flame ignites between them. <laughs> and they share a kiss. And frankly, I'm telling you, I believe that Adam started the kiss. Uh, <laughs> she went along with it because when Sharon feels unhappy, she gets intimate with men. That is kind of how she's always been. When she feels insecure or like something is wrong, she needs to be held. You know, she needs to be wanted, which is not an uncommon or horrible thing to feel in any way, but that's what she did. And they started kissing, and it wasn't even just one kiss, it was a couple of kisses. It was mwah, mwah, mwah. <laughs> with the door wide open, and Chelsea <laughs> sees the whole thing. She knows that her man 
was running off to go save Sharon, so she followed him to Sharon's house, and she got a wide open door view of Adam having Sharon kind of propped up against the fireplace mantle and kissing her. It wasn't even like she had cornered him. Like, he had her kind of cornered. Like, he was on her. <laughs> that says everything right there. And I just, like, I don't know. There's just, it's, uh, I, I can't believe it. I love it. Like, there was heat in that moment. In that moment, I was like, oh, yeah. <laughs> I was very, very, very into it. Um, <laughs> but at the same time, I'm like, oh, shoot. I want Sharon to get better on her own and not, you know, need to have a man to do it. But, well, I saw the preview for Monday's show, and it looks like Adam is going to turn around and like, uh, and tell Chelsea, look, it's, it's not what you think. And Chelsea says something like, I don't know, she says something like, you son of a bitch. <laughs> But I can't even believe that he's going to attempt to pull the old, it's not what you think, because it's exactly what she thinks. All her paranoid, you know, fantasies are exactly right. It's like there's just something about Sharon that she gets helpless, and the men are just drawn to helping her like a moth to a flame. And it just becomes like their own downfall, or it is for Adam. I mean, it's totally, I, I, sh I can't, this has got to be the final nail for his marriage. How can it go on? Chelsea needs to just give up. I really think so. I think she just needs to leave him be, leave him. Like, she can't compete with this. You cannot compete with helpless Sharon. It's just not going to happen. Plus, Chelsea has known in her heart for weeks now that Adam is drifting, and I just don't think there's anything she could do about it. If she hadn't lost the baby, then maybe things would have been different, but the fact is, a few twists of fate have derailed her marriage, and I'm sorry, but Adam is gone. He's emotionally gone from her, and he isn't coming back. Well, that was heavy. <laughs> Uh, it's the fans are so divided on the Sharon issue. They're so divided on the Adam issue that I know it's like half of you guys are gonna agree with me and half of you will not. Um, but it, and it's hard to talk about, you know. But it, you just uh, it's a heavy, heavy subject. So I feel like let's move on and talk about something fun for a little bit. You know, I love when there's an event so that I can see what everybody is wearing. So I thought we would talk a little bit about the fashion at Victor and Nikki's party. And I wanted to ask you guys, who do you think was the best dressed and the worst dressed? <laughs> I can't wait, because I know you had opinions. Um, I'll tell you what I think. First of all, I thought the best dressed, hands freaking down, was Avery. She, like, was incredibly stunning in that red dress. It, she was like, oh my god, her blonde hair, blue eyes, beautiful bright red dress, bright red lips. The, the cut of the dress was so awesome. It was like bare around the shoulders and then just a real tight shrug. It was like a totally classic look. She, I mean, she stood out in that red dress. I'm, I'm watching the scenes and I can't even, is there anybody else even in the room right now? Because for me, it's all about Avery. She looked so freaking good. Um, <laughs> I also, honestly, I, I really like Sharon's dress. I thought she looked good. It was nice for one thing to see her dressed up. She's been very cash for I don't know how long. But she had on a smoky eye. She had on some eyeshadow, some eyeliner. Um, her, you know, she had on it was like a violet colored dress, which I loved. And she had on a belt, like a tie belt with a sparkly applique kind of on the front. So it was like a beautiful violet all color and then sparkly diamondy right on the waist. She just looked really thin and really good there. The only thing I would have changed was the hair. I just want Sharon to have different hair sometimes. It's always bone straight and parted right down the middle. We need to do something else. Like, I wish she'd go see whoever cut Victoria's hair because... I mean, it needs some body, it needs some curl, like, just take it up a couple of 
inches, maybe six inches, give it some softness to it and, and a little bit of curl, a little bit of something. Or, or for crying out loud, put it up sometimes or leave it down sometimes or do something. Her hair is always the same. <laughs> A special hair would have really made the whole outfit, but I did like how she looked, and I liked how Chelsea looked too. She had um, um, like this plum dress with kind of a crisscross halter. It was like a halter top, but then it crisscrossed kind of around her neck, and um, it was just I don't know, it was really beautiful. Beautiful, actually. I kept looking at it at different points, and I couldn't tell if it was plum. Or if it was like brown. I don't know. Cause it seemed like it was looked different in different lighting. So I don't know what color it was actually now that I think about it. But I, I liked it. Um, I think the worst dress for me, and it wasn't even that bad, was Victoria's dress. I just didn't love it. It was kind of a nude color sequin dress. It had these weird uh, kind of like, I don't know, pleated-ish shoulders like the shoulders on it looked weird and then when she turned around it had like a gorgeous scooped back but it just didn't fit with the rest of the dress it just didn't look right and I don't know I just thought it was a little too I don't know Amelia Heinel my goodness she's looking extra thin right now and I don't know just the dress made her look naked <laughs> And I thought she looked maybe a little too thin, very, very bony. I just, I didn't think it was that appealing. And even Nikki's dress, Nikki was wearing a heavy gold sequin. Like, the dress was just bam, 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 and the lights were popping off of it. It was like a freaking disco. Uh, it was just really chunky sequins. It wasn't bad. I didn't hate it. Uh, but it wasn't my favorite. She should have been the belle of the ball. I didn't love the hair as much, but the dress was okay. Um... I, you know, I, I, none of the guys ever really stood, stand out. Victor's all in black, of course. Adam was rocking some gray. Nick looked cute. You know, it's like, what can you do with men's suits? Usually it's the women that have the standout. Um, and even though she wasn't actually at the party, I thought that Lauren looked beautiful. As usual, she actually had on, she had less boobs than usual. Typically her dress is low cut and it's like, boom! It's, it's usually just, just Lauren's here for the party. Boobs. Um, but it was kind of a fawn colored, um, silkyish dress. But it also was kind of gathered down at one side of the waist with a beautiful diamondy applique, kind of like what Sharon had on hers. It was really pretty. I liked the colors. I thought she looked great. Of course, it was just. Too bad that she didn't get to show up to the ball and run away with the other models. There are definitely some things that I like a lot about Nick and Avery, but there are also some things where I'm like, hmm, I don't know about that. The week started out with Nick and Avery having side-by-side -side dinner scenes. Nick is trying to make himself a TV dinner while Avery is putting together a gourmet dish, uh, beef bourguignon. <laughs> know what that is but it sounds fancy it sounds delicious but Nick can't even make a TV dinner he ends up burning it in the microwave I don't, I don't know how that's possible the plastic was all melted how can you screw up a TV dinner for crying out loud <laughs> so Nick calls Avery I think wanting to get a meal and what do you know Avery has a meal like as if Avery was at home cooking beef bourguignon for one. Give me a break. She was hoping for that call. She was hoping that Nick would come over and she'd just happen to have a beautiful dish ready for him. And it worked. Uh, <laughs> uh, I think she was also especially hoping that Nick would give her a call because she knows that Nick needs a new direction in his life. And I think we all kind of know that Nick needs a new direction, a new calling. But Avery thinks she has it all figured out. She takes him to a building. I guess it's, a, it's kind of an empty, uh, sort of dusty building with, uh, with tarps covering the furniture. And sh it's, a, it's a big surprise. She says, are you ready to see your future? Here it is. He walks in the door, sees this place, and she informs him that this is his new nightclub.
Or it's his, it's his suggestion. She suggests that this should be Club Nick. This should be the new direction of his life. And, um, you know, I want to get excited about Club Nick. I really do. Uh, at the same time, it has kind of been done. Like, do you guys remember when Neil had a nightclub? What was it called? Uh, you guys are gonna have to remind me. What was Neil? What was? This is the Y N R trivia, and this is how I know if you're really paying attention. What was the name of Neil's nightclub? Um, you have to give, leave me a comment and let me know what you think about that or what the answer is to that. Um, but I mean, at the same time, it's like, yeah, we've we've had nightclubs before. I almost wish it was something a little more original I don't know what and but also there's the the point that I appreciate the thought from Avery I think that's really great that she's trying to push him um, into a new direction but it also kind of annoys me that she's known him for what five minutes and she is driving his major life decisions I mean it's not like Nick is hurting for money I'm sure he could buy a hundred of those buildings or heck, he could open a hundred nightclubs if he really wanted to but at the same time I think he randomly told her a couple weeks ago that when he was a kid he wanted to be a rock star he never said anything about wanting to own a nightclub. How do those two interact? I mean, because there'll be a music at the nightclub? I mean, it's just, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. We have so many restaurants. How is the nightclub going to be different? There'll be music? Dancing? I mean, I don't know if any of that's really going to... Does it really work for dialogues? I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. I'm probably just complaining. Frankly, I'd rather see them revamp the coffee house and make that cool, you know, or something. Like, maybe add an internet cafe or, or I don't know, something else a little more... Like, I enjoyed the spa. I thought that was kind of a fun thing for the women. I don't know. I'm not... In, maybe that's just because I'm not much of a clubber. <laughs> I don't know. I'm going to keep myself open to it. Of course, we all know Victor is going to be very disapproving of his son's life choice once Nick announces that he's going to open up a club. Victor's going to hate it. I mean, I remember when Victor was disapproving about Nick and Sharon buying the coffee house and running the coffee house. Um, if you're a newer viewer, maybe you don't know that it was Nick and Sharon who originally started Crimson Lights, and they ran it together, and of course, everybody said they couldn't do it, and it was just kind of born out of their love, and it thrived, and later, when Nick decided that he was going to go back to Newman Enterprises, I believe, um, they decided to sell it, and Kevin ended up buying it, but um, it, it was, again, a situation that's kind of been done around Nick. We've kind of already seen this and instead of Sharon it's now Avery uh, I don't know I don't know we'll just have to see like I, I, I'm nervous because I'm afraid that Nick will eventually get bored with the club just like he does with his women and then he'll move on but I, I th I'm gonna try to keep my mind open maybe it'll be fabulous and it'll be the greatest thing that's ever happened to YNR so we'll see I'm gonna give it a whirl um, you know, I don't know, I'd rather have people at Nick's new club, Club Nick, rather than them at the Blue and Brown restaurant, which I still hate, by the way, so <laughs> I'm going to keep my fingers crossed that Club Nick turns out to be amazing. So, Nick and Avery, this is kind of also a big step for them. I mean, I'm sure she's going to be heavily involved in this club. She'll probably be the head chef or at least a consultant on the menu or something. Um, but, I mean, they're they're starting even to step out as a couple. Nick invited her to go uh, to this party at Victor and Nikki's together. And it was interesting <laughs> that Avery, Avery didn't want to go to the party with him. She was really resistant on it. I, I, it's weird because she's been working so hard to want to be with him, and this is part of who he is. He is a Newman. If you're gonna take all of the Newman awesomeness, you kind of got to deal with the crap, and there's plenty of crap. So she d did end up deciding that she was going to go to the party, but I wonder why she was so against it. And I almost think that maybe it was that she was kind of worried about what this says about her. I mean, she is, after all, dating her sister's husband. They're not even divorced yet. I wouldn't feel entirely comfortable taking that out into public either. 
So, uh, I don't know. There was a lot of hesitation there, and I think that's the reason why. The party was a disaster, of course, and after that argument over Newman Enterprises between Victor and Nick, that just sealed the deal. When Nick got home, he was like, Psh, that's it. No matter what, I'm not going back to Newman Enterprises. I think <laughs> the real question is, how soon will Club Nick be open for business? Phyllis just found out that Summer has been skipping school, and I, I, I think it was pretty rude of Nick to not tell Phyllis. Nick knew last week. Um, of course, maybe it was only a couple days in YNR time, but he should have told her right away. It's They share a daughter together. She needs to be kept in on the loop on what's going on in her daughter's life. I can understand why Nick wouldn't want to be involved with her, but he does need to be a parent together with Phyllis, and they're not very good at that. I mean, Summer's not even 18 yet, <laughs> so it's still a joint effort raising this kid. Uh, and she's skipping school and hanging out in their storage locker? I get, I maybe I didn't totally catch that. I th it, to me, it looked like she was hanging out in a storage locker, looking through their old papers and family memorabilia, kind of like the equivalent of going through the stuff in the attic, kind of. And she's, you, know, you can tell that she obviously doesn't want to go to school because people are saying stuff about her and, you know, what's going on with Newman Enterprises. But also, it was kind of insightful that it shows as she's going through the family memorabilia, it shows that she really is distraught about the fact that her mom and dad have been broken up, that her family is broken up, not just at her mom and dad, but the whole Newman family is divided. And I think furthermore, she's upset about how the whole thing went down. So uh, Nick and Phyllis call her home and start parenting her young lady. And uh, everything is fine, of course, between uh, Summer and Nick. It's really that Summer has the problem with Phyllis that is driving this. Phyllis wants to ply Summer with gifts of makeup and stuff and be the good guy and be the friend. But what she really needed to do all along was have this heart to heart with her daughter. And that's finally what Phyllis did this week. They sat down and Phyllis said, I know you hate your family, but my family was way worse. Let me tell you what happened to me. And and Summer actually started opening up a little bit and telling Phyllis what was really on her mind. And it seemed like at the end of that scene that Summer was starting to get back on the right path. Now, meanwhile, Fen is scaring me. He is scaring me. There's just something <laughs> that's developed that's creepy about him. I like it, but it's creepy. Um, he's, he's mouthing off to Lauren and Michael, seeming just unnecessarily hostile. He's obviously jealous of Jamie and the fact that Summer has been paying attention to him and the fact that his parents have been paying attention to him. And so Fen is taking it out on this poor kid. I, I mean, Fen confronted Jamie and was like, straight up, stay away from Summer and stay out of my life. Just stay away. And obviously, the, Jamie was intimidated. <laughs> it was kind of weird because um, now Fen is, you know, seeing his parents taking a shining to this kid. Michael and Lauren tried to invite Jamie to dinner over at their house and they thought, hey, maybe these two, you know, maybe our kids can be friends, Fen and Jamie. And Jamie turned them down. He was like, no. And he kind of walked away all skittishly. And Michael and Lauren figured out that I think that, like, he's scared of Fen. <laughs> Michael even said, who's scared of Fen? <laughs> But he is. Finn has intimidated uh, Jamie, and uh, Lauren kind of took that as an opportunity to kind of connect with Jamie. She walked up to him and tried to talk to him a little bit. The kid is very standoffish. I just, I, I like him. I, I, I would love to see Lauren or just anybody else just take this kid under their wing. I, he's so cute and so, he's just not confident in himself and he's had a bad life and I just want to give him a hug. <laughs> 
Honestly, I pay more attention to the scenes that Jamie's in than I do some of the veterans. I don't know what it is. Just, you know, this kid is innocent. You know, he hasn't really, you know, he's just a kid. He hasn't done anything, you know, to deserve his crappy life. And I, I don't know, everybody's being mean to him left and right. I just feel bad for him. And Lauren scolded Fen. Like, why, why are you, what is your problem with this, you know, with, with Jamie? You need to be a role model. Lauren actually pulled out the, I think you'd be the kind of person that could be a role model to him. He doesn't have the kind of life that you have. She pulled out that card and Fen actually went over to Jamie and apologized to him. Although I don't know if it was for real. It seemed like Fen was actually trying to connect with Jamie, but at the same time, I don't know if I believe it. I just don't know what Fen is going to do next. He clearly has had his heart broken by Summer, which uh, Michael and uh, Lauren have figured out by the fact that Fen specifically didn't want to go to Victor and Nikki's party because Summer was going to be there, whereas a couple weeks ago he couldn't get enough of her. He wanted to hang out with her all the time, but now his heart's been broken, and I mean, Summer let him on. Summer got his hopes up with kisses and making out, and then she just dropped him. And I don't, I don't think she meant to. I think Summer is so selfish. And she just didn't understand the consequences of toying with him. So now he feels slighted, I think, by everyone in his life. He's ignoring Summer's calls. She actually called him and asked him if he could come over to the party and, and help her and talk to her. She needed a friend right now, and Fen made up some excuse to get off the phone. But I just wonder. I, I wonder where this is going. And I kind of am thinking, I just wonder if Fen is going to maybe get obsessive on Summer, kind of in the same way that Michael got obsessive on Christine? What has Noah gotten himself all caught up in? He got that bag of money delivered to him by this girl, Adriana, with a note. I don't even remember what it said, like something like, take care of this for me or keep hold on to this for me. He's holding money for this girl that he was in love with when he was in New York. And now a cop has showed up in Genoa City, a detective, uh, and NYPD, to question Noah and to find out what, like, whatever this girl is involved in, it's bad, it's illegal, and now Lo Noah is literally left holding the bag. I don't know if he was involved with, with it or if he was just kind of on the sidelines with whatever this girl was doing, but... The point is, we have a new cop, um, which I was initially really resistant to. I'm just not into cops. I'm not into cop storylines. Um, but, you know, I thought that the guy was kind of interesting. His name is Alex, and he is an ex- GH star, um, ex Diego on GH, uh, but he is now in town. He's he's got a little bit of a different vibe about him. He's he first goes to the coffee house before he goes anywhere, and he starts asking Kevin questions about Noah. And it's funny that Kevin's initial reaction is kind of to lie for Noah. I don't think they're huge friends, but Kevin just kind of has the instinct to sort of cover up for someone in his inner circle. So Kevin gets real tight lipped and doesn't want to tell the cop anything, but the cop, like, Alex is in the coffee house kind of being hyper. It's interesting. He has a an interesting presence um, within the scene. Like, he he's, like, sh he's getting a cup of coffee, and he's shaking the creamer, like, showing Kevin that the creamer can is empty, and he grabs a pack of, like, a, a, several sugar packets and is just shaking them, just shaking, shaking, shaking them during the scene. Um, really dramatically. It was funny. It just seems kind of hyper. And after he gets done at the coffee house, did, wasn't able to get anything out of Kevin, he actually goes goes to the ranch and knocks on the door and talks to Noah and Noah lets him in and again Alex was kind of in Nick's house and he's like touching everything he's walking around looking around just touching things I'm sure just trying to see what uh, you know trying to make Noah nervous I mean for crying out loud Noah has this bag of money hidden in a box right by the door and Alex was right near that box I mean he had his hands on the box so it was yeah, I'm sure he's trying to de detect whether or not Noah is lying to him. He's questioning him, and I, I, Noah's not given in. He kind of tells half-truths. I don't know where this is going. Um, 
I don't know what kind of trouble Noah is in. I, you know, I do kind of think that the Alex had kind of a good personality. Uh, I'm going to keep myself open to it. I wonder who else he's going to interact with in Genoa City because since Sharon and Noah are becoming close, I'm wondering, like, Noah's the only one besides Adam who knows Sharon's secret that she actually burnt down the ranch. So I'm wondering if somehow Sharon will be able to return the favor and help Noah cover up for whatever it is that he's involved in. in. And I don't know, who knows, perhaps she will interact with Alex and maybe develop a new love interest? Alex could be a potential match for Victoria, too. I don't know. She's still recovering from having been kidnapped, and she actually sat down and opened up to Billy a little bit this week about her experience and how she felt afraid, afraid that um, that they would never come back, that when she was being held, that they would never come back for her, and she would just slowly starve to death. She was worried that he wouldn't come, I and mean, all of her confidence just went away, you know, in this horrible situation situation and it got the best of her and she actually talked to Billy about that this week instead of keeping it all inside which was good. I mean she really probably needs to be talking to a therapist but I am glad she opened up to someone about it. Um, and Billy's in a unique position because he wants to be there for his wife but he's also the cause of what's happened. So he is wanting to save his marriage but he also knows better than to push because it wouldn't take very much for her to, you know, just turn it on to him. I mean, he's he's like a hair away from his marriage completely being over and he knows it. So he's trying, I think, to, to tread lightly. And also I think he's trying to kind of deflect attention from himself because Jack stopped by the house this week after Kyle kind of encouraged him to make up with Billy and Jack tried to extend the olive branch and tell Billy you know that he wants them to get back on track with their relationship and, and Billy is super bitter towards Jack. Jack was trying to mend the fence and Billy wasn't having it. He just blames Jack for sending Victoria off on this, you know, mission that got her kidnapped and Victoria ended up walking into the room while they were having this argument and she too kind of jumped on Jack and sort of blamed him, which to me seems absolutely ridiculous. Like, if this guy wanted to kidnap Victoria, he would have done it anywhere, anytime. If she hadn't gone to Miami, he could have easily come to Genoa City and kidnapped her there. So I, don't, I just don't see how it's Jack's fault in any way, shape, or form. Again, I feel like it's Billy trying to deflect attention away from himself, which is sad for Jack because even though they had falling out about what was going on with Newman Enterprises um, and Billy kind of being the mole, still they're brothers and Jack needs help right now. It doesn't seem quite like Phyllis and Kyle are getting the job done. So I think Jack needs his brother. I, I'm, and it's unfortunate that it's just not working out. Um, Victoria, again, she's trying to recover, but there's still stress all around in her life. She got the invitation to go to her parents' housewarming party. She didn't want to go, but she thought, hey, I still really want, I love my mom, I want to be with her and Nick, and she thought it would be like a quiet, nice family gathering. How wrong she was. <laughs> I think she, when Sharon showed up, it, like, it just got Victoria riled up to the max. Uh, uh, Victoria was probably more riled up than anyone else there. It's almost like Victoria was needing a place to put all of her frustration and anxiety and Sharon was there at the right moment and she just fit that bill and Victoria just was really vicious toward Sharon. Um, it was hard for her, you know, she's going through a lot too. They both are. Um, I think Victoria has a, a real obvious reason to be traumatized. She's the one that should be talking to the therapist, but she gets home from the party and Billy has created a surprise for her. He has converted the living room into an island theme, kind of reminding them of their marriage in Jamaica. There's lots of, um, you know, like probably coconuts and... <laughs> Lots of, you know, palmy sort of stuff and it sort of looks like a beach and um, I don't know if he's going to pop up and start serving her drinks and try to, you know, have this relaxing time with her or 
if he's just gonna stay away and let her have some recovery time just to, you know just to relax on her own without feeling the pressure of their relationship too like let her focus on her problems rather than the marital problems um, I don't know I don't know what he's planning but another casting update Billy Miller is staying around so he's gonna be sticking around in Genoa City at least for now so Billy and Victoria fans maybe there is hope for their marriage after all I love Kyle's crush on Phyllis. Oh, I can't even tell you how much I love that. I just think it's so interesting. And as one of you guys pointed out to me, it's almost like a callback to when Jack had the affair with Jill while she was married to John. Like, Kyle is interested in Phyllis while Jack is too. So it's a weird father-son triangle that's potentially developing. And I'm not saying that I want anything to come of it, but it's just, it, I enjoy it so much. I just so finally, for the first time, feel something positive for Kyle since he's been in town. Like, Kyle is slick. He's just like his father. I mean, Jack has always been slick. And that's, it's, he's totally has developed that quality. Um, Kyle wants Phyllis to stay in the house. He wants to have, to have her around. He likes looking at her and being her hounder. And Phyllis has decided to move back to her penthouse, so she's got her bags all packed, and Kyle slicks on in there and tries to get her to stay, tries to convince her to stay, and there was this funny little moment when he just sort of put his arm around her waist in a in just a funny uh, little tiny way and even later at the coffee house he was gazing at her and she said you know your attitude toward me is kind of throwing me off you're being awfully nice and he's like oh you know I I just like ya you know I was a kid back when we weren't getting along and now I'm an adult just so just let's be friends it was it was just funny the way he's always sort of drooling over her and at the coffee house while he was drooling over her Eden was behind the counter and they are supposedly dating so she calls him out on this she says you're not really returning my calls and now I find you here with Phyllis she calls Kyle out on this crush and also she called Phyllis a cougar <laughs> she said something like I, I really you know Kyle talks his way out of it like oh no what are you talking about I'm not into her and Eden says something like well good I wouldn't want you to be involved with that cougar or something it was funny I just totally enjoyed it and again I don't want anything to go anywhere I think it would be really weird to see Kyle and Phyllis together but it's an, a funny undertone to an otherwise very serious situation. Jack is full on addicted to his pain pills. He is not acting like himself. He is edgy. He is forceful. He is being just straight up rude and uh, to Kyle, to Phyllis, to everybody. He's just he for he's forgetting things that just happened. Conversations that just happened. He's forgetting them. Like he's clearly on edge. Everyone is noticing it. Phyllis, Kyle, even Avery. Everybody knows that something's not right with Jack. Adam is still in charge of Newman Enterprises and when people try to bring it up to Adam, Adam just seems like he's not too concerned. He's like, hey, I trust Jack, he can do what he's gonna do and uh, you know, maybe this is just his way of healing. So Adam's trying to explain it away, but at the same time, Victor has provided Adam with some information. <coughs> Victor tells Adam that, you know, clues him in that Jack has taken some pretty heavy pain medicine and that it's an addictive and Adam is looking it up it's in his consciousness I think that as Adam tries to make it seem as if his he's just keeping Jack's seat warm but there is you know his interest is peaked Victor has pushed him I think just the right way and Adam possibly is he is either going to just hope Jack goes over the edge on his own and then that will benefit him or I don't know maybe he is gonna think about trying to have Jack declared incapacitated or, or unable to run the business so that Adam can kinda keep in that seat I'm not sure uh, 
but <sighs> Jack is getting close to the edge. He really is having problems. I mean, the fact that he can't remember what has just transpired is a difficulty for him doing business. He's pushing himself so hard, and he is taking all of these pain pills. He's taking more than is prescribed, and he's in pain and out of meds. He's, he's taking all of the pills that he has, and the doctor won't give him any more. He calls up the doctor, asks him for a prescription, and the doctor says no. You, you, Jack keeps saying, oh, I lost the old prescription. The doctor, his family doctor, is not stupid. He can see right through this and tells him no. I'm not just going to write you another prescription. That's not how this is going to go down. So Jack calls an old family friend, I guess, an old doctor friend, or I guess, and asks him if he'll write the prescription. And Jack is real charming, you know, just says, oh, I just need these to, to tide me over until my next appointment, you know. Hey, you can just do me that favor, right, Doc? And the doc, I mean, this guy doesn't want to do it either. It's not his patient. Basically, someone calls you up and asks you to just write a prescription. That's totally unethical. And the doctor even said, this is unethical. So Jack pulls out a lot of cash and says, hey, does this soothe your, your worries anymore? How about this cash here? As if doctors don't make enough money. Uh, I tell you what. The doctor ends up writing him the prescription but tells him, don't contact me again. I hope that that doctor loses his license and gets prosecuted. I hope that that's where this is going because at first I was skeptical about this storyline. If it's just a pain addiction, pill storyline, I mean, I, that's one thing. But I kind of think that there's an opportunity to take this in a good direction. Like, there are a lot of unethical doctors out there. I know! I used to work with them. I worked for years in the pharmaceutical industry, and let me tell you, it is a dirty, dirty business. And I, th I think it's coming to light right now, especially because there are a lot of prescription drug deaths. And a lot of people who have money, who can just buy drugs whenever they want them, it's especially a problem for them. So I'm interested to see Jack's recovery, but I also, I'm kind of, I hope that what we're going to see is some of the underlying issues be addressed. At the end of last Friday's show, Lily and Kane were making love on Neil's desk, and Neil was just about... He was headed back to the office. He was just about to catch them and walk in, and then that totally got dropped. What happened to that? <laughs> I thought that was going to be awesome. That was the thing I was looking forward to the most. I wanted to see Neil walk in and catch them in a compromising situation, and it would be like a wah wah moment. But no, it just went away. Oh well. Um, Leslie is coming to work for Jabot uh, under Neil's tutelage, uh, but uh, Leslie is very hesitant about it. She has been involved with Neil. They didn't have sex or anything, but they dated a little bit, and she realizes that it's probably not a good idea to uh, work for someone you used to date. It could get very sticky, so she's having this uh, conflict. Should I work with Neil? Do I want to work with Neil? Or do I want to date Neil? Because this sort of tension doesn't seem to be gone. I think Leslie is still very attracted to him. I think Neil is probably still getting over what happened with Harmony, but I, you know, he's probably interested. He's free. It's not gonna, it's only gonna be a matter of time until they do hook up. And, you know, I think it could be good. I'm still holding out hope that Drew is going to come back, but I I think Leslie is very beautiful. She is very, very gorgeous, and you know, she, you know, she could be a good match for Neil. We'll just have to see. I, I'm going to have to keep myself open on that one and see where we go. She takes the job, and Neil just promises to fire her if things decide to get serious, which is not even funny, because it's like, this is her whole career. She was a partner at her at, at Vance Abrams agency and now she's working in a corporate job that definitely is not paying as much I can almost guarantee that uh, but uh, yeah so I mean she's probably salaried for crying out loud but she's working there now and we'll just wait to see how things heat up between her and Neil where the heat is not for me is around Devon. I mean, Devon is working at Jabot. He's coming in. He's seeing that things are real stuffy. 
Um, Jabot is kind of a creative atmosphere, or it should be, and it's very kind of a boring place to be. So Devon is trying to convince Neil to stop being so stuffy. And he even, like, they had this conversation. I almost zoned out. They had this long conversation about how maybe they should institute casual Fridays at Jabot. And I'm thinking, woohoo, this is exciting. Casual Fridays at Jabot. This is riveting TV here, you guys. <laughs> Something needs to happen. I'm, I feel not as interested in Jabot, to be honest. There's stuff going on at Newman. Not as much at Jabot. It's just, yeah, okay, Neil and Leslie, chemi sex chemistry, uh, Devon and Kane, possible rivalry. But other than that, there's not a whole lot of big moves. It's just not that engaging. I, I don't know. I feel like... Jack has been talking a little bit about combining Jabot and Newman Enterprises. I don't think I think that might be a good thing just to get everybody kind of incorporated, um, to get some action happening. And I don't know, I feel like maybe it would be interesting if, you know, when Victor gets Newman Enterprises back, because we all know he will, if the companies are merged, I think it would be cool to see everyone having to choose a side. Okay, that takes me to the end. I've got no more YR chat in me, <laughs> but I know you do. Go ahead, leave me a comment. Let me know what you guys think about this week's show. Um, it's always interesting to read your comments, so don't be shy. <laughs> Go ahead and let me know what you think. I mean, I feel like I'm dishing out the truth here. I know I'm not making everybody happy with my opinions, but you can't make everybody happy, so I'm just going to tell you the truth, <laughs> just tell you how I feel, and I would love it if you would do that in return. So go ahead, leave me your comments, let me know your thoughts, and I'll be back next week to chat with you again about our favorite show. So everybody take care. I love you. All right. Bye.